Good. I will. Uh, well, thanks for joining everyone. Um, this is the probably the tenth or so of these webinars that we've been running. We've been doing some of them on on GoToWebinar, what we're using now. We've been we've been doing some of them on Facebook Live. The basic idea is to help as many of our clients and, and obviously the broader uh, small medium business community as possible uh, through the um, through the challenges that, that we're all being faced with uh, with the COVID nineteen economic crisis. Obviously. Um, early on, so sort of so, couple, six weeks ago or so, there was there was constant, um, you know, new programs, legislation coming out, and so on and so forth. That's all kind of uh, calmed down a bit now. So what we're doing now is a bit of a deeper dive into into um, the specifics of how to do certain things within your business. Today, what we're focusing on is, is employment law. We've got James True here, who's a practice leader at Legal Vision, who's going to get into the, the, the nitty gritty about how you can actually, uh, you know, make changes in the workplace from an employment law perspective. Um, so we'll go through that. We'll talk a bit about the JobKeeper program just to make sure that, you know, everyone who's on the webinar um, has a good understanding of that. I hope that most of you are, uh, have obviously uh, kind of taken action with regards to JobKeeper, but if, if we've got specific questions on that, we'll go into that. And then what we'll do at the end is uh, is basically um, answer answer questions. So if you've got questions, you can type them into uh, into the question box. We've also got a lot of questions that have come through pre-webinar. We've got you know 150 or so attendees. We'll probably hit about 300 a bit later on. So there's a lot of a lot of people who've submitted questions and, and want to get those answered. So we'll jump into that towards the end of the of the webinar. So uh, James, before we uh, before we get into uh, uh, the the sort of specifics of employment law, just maybe give a bit of background on, on yourself and and what you do at Legal Vision. Thanks, Lachlan. Um, yeah, so look, I head up our employment team. Um, employment really uh, is a real hot issue at the moment um, for employers. So we're doing a lot of advice on how you manage um, ultimately your payroll, how you manage your workforce um, in any kind of um, way. So as I said, the biggest issue for businesses at the moment is actually getting that payroll liability down. Um, but with the Australian industrial laws that we have, um, they are particularly employee friendly and they're also extremely complicated. Um, and so there is a, a lot of wading through, um, a fair bit of handholding that, um, that myself and my team do with clients in terms of how they navigate that, um, both in terms of the messaging they're giving to their employees and then uh, also backing that up with documents um, so that they are putting themselves in the best position um, if they're asked for future um, terminations um, and any claims coming from that, um, that our clients are in the best position to respond to it. So um, look, we do a lot of um, um, general uh, advice, which we like doing over the phone where we can try and get to the point um, and then create an action plan from an employer uh, in how they do it um, and all the documents to execute it. So there's been a lot of that um, in relation to um, what businesses have been experiencing with COVID. Um, and that's really been, um, you know, what uh, the focus of my team has been recently. There's another aspect um, to employment law at the moment, um, which is also um, navigating your work health safety obligations. So every employer across the country um, uh, will have um, fairly similar work health safety obligations and duties of care owed to its employees uh, and managing those through um, through this uh, pandemic um, is also something that we provide a lot of advice on um, uh, to clients um, because even though um, it's different for every business but uh, even where you've got your employees working from home and not actually in your physical workspace for those businesses who are doing that, um, all those obligations still um, carry across. Um, so it's um, sometimes it's been a bit of a forgotten uh, issue for employers, um, but that's something we're also providing a lot of advice on at the moment. Okay, great. So let's get into um, you know the sort of nitty gritty of, of what businesses can do right now to uh to get their their payroll cost down ultimately what we're talking about here is you know a vast number of businesses you know the, the majority of australian businesses have seen a significant reduction in top line revenue um over the last couple of months and the result of that is that is that their costs are higher than uh, than their revenue and and the biggest cost in most businesses is is payroll um, and so unfortunately, um, you know, that, that, that's somewhere where 
you know, as, as a business owner, as an operator, you need to kind of look at that uh, pretty quickly and, and take some action. The government's done some things to, 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 to help employers manage um, that situation. But, but James, can you, can you give us a brief overview of the various options open to, open to business owners who are looking to reduce their, their payroll uh, rapidly um, and, uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, within the confines of the law? Yeah, definitely. So, um, as you say, there have been a few government initiatives um, which have stepped in here, and this does kind of change the ball game a little bit. So, it's worth looking at it pre-JobKeeper. Um, there are a lot of businesses who are issuing stand downs. Um, this is a term which has come up a lot. Um, never used to very much since COVID, everyone's talking about stand down. Now, prior to JobKeeper, issuing a stand down was really difficult and there were really limited exemptions or, or, or circumstances where you could do it. And pretty much boiled down to, you know, if you were running a business that the business itself had been shut down, maybe by a government direction, good example being maybe a pub, um, then you were going to be entitled to issue a stand down, which was effectively everyone go home and we stop paying you now. Um, now, a lot of businesses did that. A lot of businesses created a lot of risk for themselves in issuing stand downs when they weren't entitled to. Um, there are other options available um, to a business rather than going as kind of as drastically as issuing a stand down. And a big key um, is messaging and employee buy in. The guiding principle here is putting stand down aside and we'll get to stand down in the context of JobKeeper because that's quite critical now and is, is creating a lot of options. The guiding principle absent those um, stand down directions is that an employer can't unilaterally change the terms and conditions um, of an employee's employment. You can't just force a change, whether that be to a salary um, or whether that be to hours of work. Um, that means you need buy-in. But once you've got buy-in and you've got employee consent, you've got a lot of options. So for example, the, the starting point um, options that a company can do if they're trying to get the um, payroll liability down is to ask people to take pay cuts. Um, if an employee agrees, and if after you've cut the pay rate, they're still under, or they're still above their, their minimum wage entitlement, either from the national minimum wage or maybe under a modern award or an enterprise agreement, um, as long as they're still above that, you're okay. By agreement, you vary their terms and conditions. Um, you effectively ask them to do it and say, look, this will help save the business um, and it'll help save your job. So would you please do it? Now, um, an employee doesn't have to agree to that, but if they do, great. Um, excellent, and in that sense, you can. And, and on that, on that, in terms of your experience over the last kind of six weeks or so of these conversations, how are employees re reacting to, to that sort of a request? Yeah, look, different business by business. Um, I, I probably, in a sense, have been surprised that um, a lot of employees have been quite agreeable to that. Um, and you know, to be fair, this is this is unprecedented um, for businesses to face this type of disruption. Um, and so, I think a lot of employees do understand. Well, you know, this is not the employer just doing this because they think, why not? I'll have a go. Um, they are understanding that these are sort of critical times for businesses, and that you know, everyone has to pitch in um, to help the business survive. Of course, I mean, as there is um, always, um, and, and in most organisations, there are always going to be the employees um, who aren't interested in um, in taking the pay cut, um, or you know, whether it's a call it getting on board and um, and doing what everyone else is doing, trying to assist the business. Um, so certainly, there are um, there are employees who are either for whatever reason it might be, it could be their personal um, financial circumstances, which means they can't do it, um, or it could be you know a natural sort of distrust of their employer um, and not getting on board with that. So. The messaging when you go to the employees and request these types of things is really critical that they understand why you're doing it. Um, but then also the consequences of, well, if they do it, if they don't do it, what might what might happen? Um, so you can ask to change the wage. Um, another way to get that across the line is to say, well, could we also change your hours? So work less, we'll pay you less, prorate your wage. Um, some employees have been um, more amenable um, to that. If they're going to get paid less, they may as well work less. Um, the backstop to that conversation, and if you don't get the employee's agreement, 
is that the next step available to them is a redundancy. Um, now, depending on the size of your business, um, you may not actually have to pay a redundancy. So ordinarily, you'd hear that you know someone's employment is terminated on account of redundancy, they get a redundancy pay. And it goes on a scale depending on how long you've been with the business. Um, so for example, if you've been there for a year to two years, it's a four-week redundancy pay, but it goes up to about 16 weeks um, depending on, on how long you've been there. If it's a business with fewer than 15 employees all up, there's no obligation to make that redundancy payment. So the backstop for employees in some businesses is, well, if I don't accept the, um, the pay cut or the hours cut, um, I'm not walking away with anything much else in particular. Uh, and it's a very difficult job market out there for them to move to next. So it'll be a case by case basis with each employee. Um, as Just on that, how does, how does it work if you've got a, a business that maybe has a, a number of different operating entities, you know, potentially, I don't know, a, a childcare business that um, yep. for each site has has a different operating entity and that operating entity employs the, the, the people working in that operating entity? Is it calculated on an operating entity basis or on an entire business basis? Everyone calculate all the employees across the associated entities. Um, okay. So rather than yeah, your your kind of um, site by site basis. Yep. Um, so okay. that is something to be wary of. Um, there's a final option um, in all of that, which is you know asking employees to take leave without pay. Um, and uh, you know there are I mean there are, look there are a lot of competing um, interests here um, and issues for some employees because particularly for employees who have carers responsibilities and children at school age, um, they might be finding now that if their children can't go to school or aren't going to school, um, that they're not actually in a position to be working um, throughout the day. So you can also come to agreements there with that employee that maybe they take a period of their annual leave um, or that they go on an extended period of leave without pay um, mm -hmm. while that's happening. This yep. sort of leads into that, that was the position, that's where everyone stood. Um, and then comes the JobKeeper stand down provisions. Um, so these are relatively recent and this is a sort of a new right, so to speak, an employer might have um, if they qualify for JobKeeper. So if your business doesn't qualify for JobKeeper, then you've got to go with everything we've just discussed in terms of your options. But once JobKeeper becomes um, an option for you, there's sort of a new avenue of directions that you might be able to make, then make um, to an employee. Um, which really relates and, and boils down to one, you can direct them to change their hours. So you might reduce their hours down to just the amount that JobKeeper would cover them for. Um, mm -hmm. So that then all they're getting is the JobKeeper and all you're getting from them is the value of whatever, let's call it whatever JobKeeper buys you in terms of their hours. Mm -hmm. You can ask them or, or direct them to change their duties is another thing that you can do. So ordinarily you've got someone working in one part of the business, but that's shut down, but you could move them somewhere else. Well, their employment contract says, no, you're employed in this role and you perform these duties. The new provisions will allow you to direct them to move over and do those different duties. Not normally something that um, is too much of an issue to get past, but nonetheless, it's the, the support is there for the employer now to make that um, direction. And then building onto these is also um, annual leave requests. Um, so now an employer can request that the employee take a period of annual leave and the employee cannot unreasonably refuse the request. There are a few little um, um, points on, on all of these issues when you're going to, um, to make one of these directions, including around consultation, um, so there's the three day window after you consult to say, hey, look, we want to make this job keep the um, enabling direction is what they get referred to now as. Um, mm -hmm. So that might be we're going to we're going to bring your hours down consistent with whatever job keeper will cover. Um, so three days um, after you've had the consultation before you issue the direction, um, but the employee can agree to a lesser period. Um, the, the next part, if you were going to make a request and say, well, you take your annual leave and employee can't um, unreasonably refuse it, uh, is that they've got to have a two week leave balance at the end of it. Um, so it sounds like a good option, um, but it's really there when your employees have sort of more significant um, amounts of annual leave in the bank, 
And there's also an ability now um, to take the leave at half rate. Um, so, you know, if someone does have um, four weeks there, you can use your four weeks to have them out of the business for eight um, and apply it across, say, that eight week period with these new directions. So, um, as I said, all of that is, is predicated on whether you can qualify for JobKeeper. Um, mm -hmm. But then your options in terms of, um, of, of standing down employees and changing their hours um, becomes a, a whole lot greater once, once you're in that position with JobKeeper. So quick question on that. Let's say you qualify for JobKeeper. Um, can you select individual employees, uh, you know, for, you know, for, and say to them, I'm requiring you to, 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 to work two days a week? Um, or or do you, does it have to be something that's done across the business? No, you, you can pick and choose. Um, ultimately, it's your business to um, to structure, um, and you'll choose basically on on the basis that you're picking the people who don't have work to do. Um, mm -hmm. You do need to be cautious, of course, when you are picking or exercising particular rights against some employees and not others. Um, mm -hmm. As always, there will be a risk of things like victimization claims or discrimination claims. So when you're applying the criteria of who are we going to choose, you can pick pretty much any criteria that you're going to need to in those circumstances, as, not, as long as it's not unlawful. Um, Mm -hmm. Unlawful, as I said, would be like a, a victimization. So all the people who've recently taken sick leave, we're going to issue the direction to them. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, all the people mm -hmm. who've made workers' comp complaints, we'll issue it to them. Can't do that. Um, all our okay. union members, we're standing them down. Definitely don't do that. <laughs> okay. And what about, um, you know, how sort of flexible is this? So obviously the JobKeeper payment is supposed to last for six months, if indeed it does last for six months. Um, yep. Can you sort of quite flexibly um, say to an employee, okay, this month I need you for two days a week, but then, you know, next month things might change and we can ramp you back up to four, then back down to three. I mean, how flexible is it? Yeah, so look, as long as you're going through the consultation process on issuing the direction, you could then change the direction. Um, so you might, for example, um, be reviewing these issues on a um, on a month by month basis as your business change, as we all know, business changes pretty quickly. Um, yep. And, you know, and then the survival of the business is going to be different month to month, what your outlook might look like. Um, so in that sense, yeah, you, you could, um, you know, um, issue one for a month, come back and chat to them again. This is what the next month's going to look like. Um, and so in that situation, is, if, you've, if, you, if you said to an employee, um, okay, I need you to move to two days a week, right? Um, they can't then say, okay, I want a redundancy because, you know, if you qualify for JobKeeper, you're under this new sort of That's way right. of doing you, things. You now have the right to make that direction um, okay. as opposed to absent JobKeeper. If you go and ask an employee and say, oh, I'd really like you to move to two days a week as a way to mm -hmm. save your job and they say, well, no, I'm not doing it, um, mm -hmm. then your next step is redundancy because they do have a right to say no to that when they yep. when it's not a job keeper direction but the yep. job keeper direction is an mm -hmm. express right under legislation for an employer to issue that direction and are you seeing this being used a lot yet or or not Look, I mean, because a lot of uh, a lot of companies took action really quickly um, at the start and before. Um, I mean, the, you know, the government's moved very quickly in terms of getting these schemes up. Um, legislation does take a little while to change um, to make sure that you know things like the JobKeeper stand down has come into effect. They've done all of that as quickly as they can, but businesses have moved quicker. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Um, we definitely are seeing a lot of businesses um, moving to this at the moment. Um, we've also seen businesses who might have initially issued a stand down or asked people to go on leave without pay in the early days of COVID um, are now with, um, with JobKeeper coming back into play um, saying, mm -hmm. well, look, if you're going to be getting your JobKeeper payment and it's possible for you to be doing work, you may as well be in our mm -hmm. business doing work for us rather than sitting at home getting the payment. So yes, it, and that's, that's it an is, interesting it one because it's, it's, not, it's something that's come up a few times. Um, certainly in the in the press, um, the current affair and the like, um, employees who uh, are working for employers who qualify for JobKeeper, they qualify for JobKeeper, and they're kind of refusing to 
to actually work. Um, because that they kind of figure I'll get my three grand from the government every month, and uh, I'll, I guess I'll chill out at home watching Netflix. Okay, what's what are the rights of the employer in that situation? Yeah, so it's important to remember that JobKeeper is a payment that goes to the employer after they've made payment to the employee for the employee's wages. Um, so in that respect, an employee has to be ready, willing, and able to perform work for their employer. Mm -hmm. Um, in mm -hmm. order to receive payment of their wages. Um, so where that is happening, um, employers can be pretty confident um, in their in their rights and being able to direct that employee and say, look, if you want to be paid wages, mm -hmm. you have to do work mm -hmm. for us. That, of yep. course, um, you know, is is the case where there is work um, to be done. Um, mm -hmm. And the employer, for example, hasn't, you know, previously stood someone down um maybe that person has then understood that well there's not going to be work for a long time um if they've made other arrangements at a later date and they're kind of let's call it their refusal to work is a little bit more innocent um yep. you might see the case for example uh, probably a good example of that would be an employee who's either been stood down or told to go on um, or asked to go on leave without pay in the early days um as a result of that have pulled their children out of daycare um and said look well I'm sitting at home not working for the foreseeable future, so I'll take the kids out of daycare and we'll stop paying for daycare. Um, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the employer says, hey, job keepers here, I'm paying you, come back to work. Um, mm. In those circumstances, an employer needs to tread really carefully before they then start withholding wages from that employee because you're sure. running into discrimination issues and that type of thing. But an employee yep. who's refusing to come to work because they want to watch Netflix um, shouldn't be getting paid. Okay, interesting. And bear in mind, I think uh, daycare is now free, um, or you know, so not really a, a legal thing, but uh, certainly for anyone yep. who is in that situation, something to be considered. Yep. We were supposed to get into the details of kind of JobKeeper, but I feel like um, you know most of the, the the attendees from the questions being asked uh, have already kind of got their heads around that. So I think what would be interesting is to jump straight into some of the more employment law related questions we've received because. It's these details, um, you know, that, that, that we're seeing, I guess, ultimately, um, a fair bit of confusion around. And so if we can get into these questions, I think that's going to help people, um, you know, sort of so, sort of get through um, the next the next little while. So let's jump straight into some of these questions. Um, and, and, and James, um, you know, just jump in, but, but I'll sort of uh, read a couple of them out and we'll take it from there. So I think mm. this is a good one. Um, can an employer be stood down from work onto JobSeeker? And the employee and the company allow the employee to supplement the 750 weekly leave. So it's a bit of a strange question. I think there we're talking about JobKeeper. There, um, can the employee be stood down from work onto JobKeeper? And then I think that the question is, can can the company then have the employee or allow the employee to make money some other way? You know, get a job somewhere else or start their own little business or that that sort of thing. Is that allowed? Uh, yeah. Look, it. it it should be if that you can only get your job keeper from one employer um, but ultimately yep. you as the employer if the um, if you want to let your employee work for someone else um, yep. that's fine you, you're allowed to okay. let them do that always you know be, be careful about it have the conversation with them to make sure they're not uh, off with a, a competitor um, protect your confidential information and everything like that um, but other than that if you're happy with it um, that's fine Okay, annual leaves are a kind of complicated area for all of this. I think this is a good question. I'd love to know the rules around paying employee annual leave long and long service leave when the business is shut down due to COVID-19. So an employer can make a direction that an employee takes annual leave. Mm -hmm. And the direction has got to be reasonable. And that's about the extent of the guidance we get uh, for an employer and trying to decide whether um, whether they can do it. The reasonable question is a really difficult one. Um, a lot of employers have been proceeding on the basis that, well, if there's no work to do and we're in the middle of a pandemic, it would be reasonable for me to ask you to take some annual leave. Um, yep. So in that sense, um, uh, making the direction um, is something you can ultimately, I think, roll the dice on as an employer um, and know that, you know, it's a big process for an employee to come back um, and try and challenge that. If they do challenge it, then really it's a, it's probably a, um, a more practical question of saying, well, what are we going to do in the circumstances? And 
mm -hmm. and negotiating a position with that employee. Um, of course, remember that if you know if JobKeeper is in play at this stage, um, then now you are able to, under the JobKeeper enabling directions um, and requests, to now request that employee to take uh, the leave. And the employee can't mm -hmm. unreasonably refuse that request. So again, we're talking about um, that word reasonable and now unreasonable, mm -hmm. um, which can be pretty tricky in the circumstances. But I, I think, you know, where if you meet the kind of the criteria of when we talk about a request, so if JobKeeper is in play, let's assume that's the case. Um, yep. If they're still going to have two weeks leave balance at the end of it um, and we're mid pandemic, um, you know, look, you, you could put a fair bit of pressure on that employee to um, to take the leave. Um, so that, that's and, 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 a quick question on the accruing of leave. So, so I've got employees, I've stood them down. They're getting JobKeeper, so they're, they're still attached to the business and all that. During, and let's say for the next six months, this, this goes on, but let's say till the end of June, so three months, right? Mm. Are those employees accruing annual leave? during that, yes. those three months? They are. So okay. th there's a distinction on what type of stand down you've issued. So if we go back to that pre-JobKeeper stand down, which is the one we mentioned at the start, which is one mm -hmm. that, you know, for the most part, very few employers were allowed to make, but that a lot of employers did make. Um, in those circumstances, annual leave continues to accrue during the stand down period. Once we okay. have the JobKeeper stand down, and you might have changed the person's hours of work. Um, so say they're now in only working one day a week for you and on JobKeeper, the annual yep. leave will accrue as though you didn't make the JobKeeper direction. So on what their their entitlements were pre you reducing their hours. Okay, interesting because you know from 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 the perspective of a business owner who who's got a, a workforce that they can't work for whatever reason, um, would the the best approach and, and what you really want to do is is get to the end of this whole period, pandemic period, back to business as usual with your, your annual leave balance as, as, as you know, low as possible, right? So you, you don't want to have built up a massive annual leave balance on, on your P&L, on your balance sheet. So, um, should, you know, I guess would, would the, the technique, the tactic there to be paying people their annual leave on a monthly basis, so paying them slightly more than job capable, making sure that, you know, at the end of it, they haven't accrued any annual leave. Yeah, you could you could certainly try and get that down as as you go, um, and you know, it's possible to get a sort of combination of of working mm. hours and taking annual leave to keep the liability down. So, as you say, you don't get to the end of this um, with yeah. a massive annual leave liability. And what about long service leave? Just quickly. Yeah. So, look, long service leave is different state by state. Um, unlike the, the Fair Work Act covers everyone um, in Australia, or most employers anyway, um, and so annual leave, sick leave um, is all are covered under the Fair Work Act. Long service leave is state by state. Um, typically, the, the, the entitlement um, will crystallise at 10 years uh, service. Um, that's been recently changed down um, in Victoria. I think Victoria is now seven years. Um, they mm -hmm. brought it down a bit. Um, so, look, in that sense, if they have the entitlement and it's crystallised, um, i.e. they're past the relevant service period, um, then they could take that as well. Um, okay. And they could elect to take that. Most states say by agreement um, is when you when you take it. And then some states do have provisions for taking it early. So if someone mm -hmm. is um, almost there, um, then it is possible that they can take it early by agreement in some states. So it's always state by state, check what the legislation says. Okay, good. So we start looking at, you know, obviously to, to, for an employee to, to qualify for, for JobKeeper, they need to be an employee, not a subcontractor. So we've got an interesting question here. How do you decide if a person is an employee or subcontractor? It seems to be a large gray area with Fair Work Australia's definition. Yeah, grey area is right. Um, so the the upshot in in when when we're looking at is it an employee or a contractor. Um, sometimes the first go to position will be, well, what's the contract that you've got in place there? Do you have an employment agreement in place, or do you have an independent contractor agreement in place? Um, if these relationships are ever challenged, and a court has to decide 
court doesn't care what document is in place. They just look at the relationship as a whole um, in its totality and they consider it under two key um, indicia really. Um, and they're questions about integration and control. So really, how much is this person integrated into your business as opposed to are they carrying on a business of their own and providing services to you? And the control question is in the performance of their work, what type of control are you exerting on them? So a good example, and you sort of, you know, uh, a, a real go-to example of a, of a contractor might be a plumber um, who comes around. And when we look at integration and control, well, they're coming and doing work at your business. They're not part of your business. Um, they're very much um, running a business of their own. Um, they don't have your email signature. They're not wearing your uniform or anything like that. Um, so they're very clearly not integrated into your business. They're from the outside coming in. When we look at control, you might ask them or tell them what needs fixing, for example, but you certainly don't tell them how to do it. Um, they have the expertise in how to perform that work and provide that service and it's left to them based on their skills and knowledge to do it. So when we bring that back into a right into the grey area um, that a lot of companies um, are sort of right in the middle of um, at all times because someone might have and, and often it's because they want to manage their own tax, um, they want to manage their own super and their own finances. Um, because they've probably got some, you know, complicated um, a structure set up in the background which works for them. Um, so they come to you and say, well, listen, I'm happy to be a contractor um, and I'll just submit invoices monthly rather than you pay me wages. Um, now, even if both parties agree on that, if it ever gets to the courts, again, the courts don't care that you've agreed that that's the, the case. So they'll yep. always look at that, that totality of the arrangement, but it absolutely gets murky. But you look at things, some practical things to look at. Uh, look, are they coming to your business every day to do their work? Are they signing off with your email address? Are they wearing your yep. uniform? Do they look and feel like they're part of your business and, and really all your other employees? Yep. Or are they carrying on a business of their own and providing external services, which is different to what your business does? Are they providing them from the outside in to you? And that's you, that's yeah. your more, you're more of your contractor. And I mean, in terms of JobKeeper, obviously everyone wants to get JobKeeper, um, but you can only get it uh, from one business. So if you know, if you got someone who's a subcontractor and it really seems to be a subcontractor, well, they have their own business. If that business has seen a thirty percent drop in in revenue, um, then they should qualify through their business. So you don't need to arrange that through your business. It's important to remember that. <laughs> Um, That's right. Okay, let's let's get into um, a couple of um, a couple of uh, this is an interesting one, slightly strange question in some ways. Um, can I terminate a casual staff member who's on JobKeeper due to work being very limited? Do you yeah, on that so one? it's a an interesting one. You, I mean, look. You could, um, in the sense that your the the starting point with casual employment is that their employment starts and finishes each shift. So the employment terminates at the end of the shift for a casual employee. Um, those who are on JobKeeper are those who we you know, consider more of your kind of um, permanent type um, casual employees. Um, sure, they, they've got to have been employed since the first of March two thousand nineteen to qualify for for JobKeeper. That's right. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, if you were to do that, um, there's no, um, for example, with the casual employee, there's no redundancy entitlement or anything like that. You're just ultimately not offering them any more shifts. What most, so technically speaking, you could do that. Um, what most employees, um, so employers would do in that situation is say, well, you know, for the most part, um, we're happy just to keep paying you the job keeper amount. If there's no work to do, you don't have to do anything. Um, you can sit at home and we'll pay it for you. If work comes up, well, you'll be ready and, and we can bring you back into the business. Um, but ultimately, given that the government is footing the wages bill, we might keep you on here um, for mm -hmm. a casual. So you, you could you so could yeah. keep them on. And, and if things yeah. turn around in the future too, it means that person's still there ready to go for you. Yeah. If they've been a valued employee of your business, um, you know, apart from the cash flow issue in the sense that you have to pay the one and a half grand a fortnight 
and then you get reimbursed by by the government. So there's a cash flow issue there of you know the 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 worst time period is a six week time period where you've got to float float that cash. Apart from that, it's really kind of no um, there's no loss for the, for the for the employer to pay that um, to pay that money out because the money is kind of coming straight from the government going straight out to the employee. So you know if you can afford that kind of cash flow and it's a, and it's an employee that's kind of you know being a good employee then the best thing to do if possible is to is to keep them uh keep them on um and, and pay pay that um pay that one and a half grand uh, a fortnight because otherwise their alternatives are going to be you know um job seeker so the doll or um, you know, it's going to be hard to find a job in the current environment. So what you're really doing is is helping that individual, um, you know, get some money for the next six months. So all things to consider and every business is different, but but certainly uh, thinking about, you know, um, what you can do if possible for employees as an employer is, is you know, I think a vital part of the social contract. Um, Right, we've got uh, another uh, kind of uh, nine minutes or so. We'll, we'll, we've, got a, we've got a lot of questions, but um, let's ask. Let's get into this one. Um, I would like to ask about increasing part-time staff towards full-time temporarily with the JobKeeper and how to do it legally. So I assume what we have here is someone who's got some part-time staff. They're now getting JobKeeper for the part-time staff, and so the cost of having those part-time staff, um, you know, move, move to a, a full-time capacity. Um, you know, makes sense for his or her business, and how do you go about doing that? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is really where, um, in in Ashimi, you've got contracts of employment in place. It's going to have an hours of work clause, which says, you know, you work three days a week. Um, and this is your wage. Um, now, at any time, you can vary that by agreement with the employee. So it's really quite a simple process of, I mean, obviously assuming that employee um, is happy to work more. Um, basically saying to them, look, we'd really like to offer you, say, five days a week here. Um, and they say, yes, that's great. Um, you follow that up with a variation letter. And the variation letter just says that contract, instead of saying three days, now says five. And your salary rate now says this instead of this. Um, and that's done. What you would need to be careful of, of course, is that um, JobKeeper is going to run out on 24 September, I believe. Um, and so you would need to just make sure in your communication to the employee that this arrangement and the variation of that contract runs until 24 September, at which point you're going to revert to your, your three days a week. Sure. And potentially might even um, sort of stick in there something about 24, the, the earlier of 24 September or, um, you know, the time at which the, the, the business is no longer eligible for for JobKeeper, because I personally believe that that the government will change uh, the change the rules around this um, yeah. before 24th September, because I think there's a lot of businesses that in a couple of months' time are going to see their, their you know their, their revenue back up to roughly what it was pre-COVID, and it's not it's not going to make much much sense, um, you know, fiscally for the country to keep subsidising those businesses' wage bills, and I think the the, 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 there'll be a lot of noise around that. So I, I personally, as a business owner, would not be relying on getting JobKeeper for the whole six months. So I, I, I'd be counting on it till the end of June. And then, you know, if it keeps going great, but, you know, um, worth kind of thinking about what could happen from a, you know, political perspective around all this as well. I think that's important, um, you know, to, to, to consider. Um, again, you know, uh, I've been told that that's a whole, you know, I'm, I'm being paranoid, but I'd rather be paranoid um, and, uh, you know, be in a position where, you know, um, you, you, you can kind of succeed without JobKeeper, you know, from July onwards, if possible. Um, okay, look, let's take one last question. Um, Performance management. Um, this is a good one in, in the current environment. So, um, you know, uh, we've got a salesperson who's not meeting sales quota. Um, you know, um, how do you deal with that in the current environment? It's 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 obviously going to be hard for a salesperson to, to meet their quota. Uh, but normally, you know, in, in, in a in a performance sales environment, um, yeah, that person's job would be on the line. How do you deal with that in in, in the current kind of you know COVID nineteen environment? 
Yeah, it's um, that's certainly tough. Um, when we think about performance management um, and the obligation to performance manage someone, it usually comes in the context of making sure that the business is safeguarded against an unfair dismissal claim that the employee might bring, say, once you terminate. So in that sense, it's always worth figuring out, well, do we actually need to performance manage this person if you know we don't think their performance is up to scratch and by that I mean if the person can't bring an unfair dismissal claim which means they and in order for that to be the case it might be that they haven't been with the company long enough so they haven't been there for either six or 12 months uh, depending on the size of your business or they earn at a rate which puts them over the cap for unfair dismissal which is currently 148,700 if they're earning over that they can't bring an unfair dismissal claim so First step, figure out is performance management um, important um, to safeguard us for a claim. Um, once you get to, um, you know, say you did terminate someone's employment um, because they weren't performing and they brought an unfair dismissal claim, the Fair Work Commission is going to ask really two questions. One, did you have a valid reason to terminate the employment? And we say, well, yeah, their performance wasn't up to scratch. Okay, you might get a tick mm -hmm. in that box. But two, were you procedurally fair? And this is the big question here. Would it be procedurally fair to ask someone to generate more sales uh, in this type of economic climate? Um, and uh, you know, the Fair Work Commission a lot of the time is going to say, well, no, because if you if you're re if you're effectively measuring them based on the output um, um, or the 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 objective measure of how many sales did you land, that might not actually be procedurally very fair when it's through no fault of their own, they're not landing those sales. So rather, I think it's very important to frame your performance management um, with employees in this environment really narrowly and making it all about, well, I need you making, if, if we're talking about a sales context and sort of really crass understanding of what the salesperson might do, but whether it's, you know, I need you to make X number of calls um, and, if it's through no fault of their own that they're not landing those sales, then we're still um, we've still asked them to do something like make the calls. So if they're being lazy yep. and not making the calls, we can come back and say, well, that was fair. We asked you to make the calls, and that was within your control. Um, mm -hmm. Extend it to all those kind of smaller things that is within their control. We need your attitude on the calls um, to be better. Um, you know, that's something that is within their control. Ultimately, if businesses are saying, look, we dealt with that salesperson, your product sounds great. Um, and in any other environment, we'd love to be going, you know, on board with you guys, but this has everything to do with COVID and absolutely nothing to do with your salesperson's performance. Um, mm -hmm. Then you're wading into territory where it's hard to say that you've been procedurally fair with that employee. Yep. So think about the parts that they can control. Um, and really set very clear expectations on that employee, including in writing, um, about what you expect from them um, and their performance within within what is ultimately reasonable and within their control. Okay, great. Look, on that note, I think you know we've we've covered a fair bit of ground here, but hopefully um, everyone who, who's listening in has has got a, a better feel for you know, the opportunities around what you can do from an employment perspective, given the current environment, the challenges, what you need to be aware of, the things you need to kind of really consider before you take action. In the uh, handout section, which you'll see on, on the GoToWebinar control panel, we've got a bunch of handouts you can download um, and read, which kind of give you a, a, some more guidance around all this sort of thing. Uh, but obviously also around, you know, rental issues and and disputes issues and so on and so forth within the COVID-19 economic environment. So download them if you if you want that further info. Um, what I would say is, you know, for all of our clients, um, the, the product that, um, you know, we're servicing clients with the most right now is our LV Connect product, which which entitles, you know, it's 200 bucks a month, so very, very, very low cost um, product. And it entitles our clients to, to book in for a call uh, with a lawyer about any legal issue, as many calls as you want, um, James is one of the lawyers that takes uh, a lot of these calls. So effectively, what you're getting is you know, really effective, um, you know, really pragmatic um, advice um, on the phone. This, the sort of advice that you know, really we've been talking about over the last 45 minutes or so. And I would encourage all of you who kind of feel like you need a bit of help in this environment to consider getting in touch about that. We have a special offer for anyone who's attended this webinar. So 
Um, if you've attended the webinar, get in touch with us at uh, legalvision.com.au. Give us a call on 1300 544 755. Or indeed, you know, if you want to email Anthony, um, who's, who's our marketing director, anthony.u at legalvision.com.au, myself, Lachlan at legalvision.com.au, we'd be very happy to kind of take you through um, how we might be able to help. Uh, but I'd encourage you to really consider getting that sort of assistance because, um, you know, now's the time when a lot of businesses need it. The special offer that we've got, I won't mention what it is because, you know, get in touch to find out what it is. But um, I really, uh, you know, encourage each of you to get in touch if, if you're looking for that sort of advice. We're running these webinars uh, every, uh, every, you know, every week or so. So we'll be doing another one next week. Could be on employment law, might be on commercial leasing. Um, if you've got requests around what you want to talk about, um, or want us to talk about, what, what you're sort of interested in, so on and so forth, um, I'll um, you know, definitely get in touch, email us, let us know, because we've, we've been setting these up as a you know, reaction to what clients are asking us about on a day-to-day -day basis. So you know, really, uh, really encourage you to get in touch. Um, and, and thank you, James, for, for taking the time. Obviously, um, I pay you to do this, so you know it's not it's not really uh, it's not really, you know, you've been mandated. Uh, I could stand you down if I wanted to, but I won't. Um, so so look, you know, really um, really um, uh, think this is a really useful session, and um, encourage all of you to to consider your options. We're here to help, and have a great rest of the week. And and let's hope that you know, look, uh, schools are back next week, and. Uh, the economy can uh, can start kind of pumping again. Have a great week.